So, hello everyone, welcome to a deep adaptation Q&A with me, Jen Bendel. Uh, I was uh, looking and looking at my YouTube channel and realized this is the 35th we've done. Uh, and I find them uh, a delight. Uh, it's wonderful to have an hour together to actually explore various aspects of this agenda. And today we have uh, the Reverend Lauren Van Ham, uh, who I was delighted to meet a few months ago uh, on a course that uh, Katie and I, I teach and discover the amazing work that she's doing uh, within faith-based organizations, particularly the interfaith space uh, on um, societal disruption and collapse. Um, Lauren is an ordained interfaith minister. She served as a hospital chaplain for nine years, focusing on psychiatry, palliative care, and bereavement support. Uh, she later worked with a consulting firm on employee engagement programs on sustainability issues. And for more than a decade, Lauren was Dean of the Chaplaincy Institute, an interfaith sem seminary based in California. Lauren is a spiritual director and guest faculty for several schools now in California, and she currently serves as the Climate Action Coordinator for the United Religions Initiative, Here which is, is a global here. interfaith grassroots organization. I love that phrase, a global interfaith grassroots organization. Lauren, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Jem. It is such a privilege to be here. So I, uh, I asked, I, I said a few things about you there, but I think where I'd like to start, just so we understand a bit more about the space that you work within, could you say a little bit about um, the URI that I just mentioned and, and what you do there, just so we have that context before, before diving deeper? Absolutely. Um, I will talk about that and just before, Mm -hmm. I want to offer a grounding for us. Absolutely. Thank you. So <clears throat> when I am meeting with my spiritual direction clients, I begin by lighting a candle. And the light is to remind us that there are more than two of us in the conversation. Now, certainly in our call today, we know that there are more than two of us, but if it were just a one on one conversation, the light would remind us that we are connected to something far greater than ourselves. We might call it life, we might, we might call it love, we might call it God, we might call it mystery. Um, I often call it reverence, which maybe we'll talk more about later. And this light also is useful for us as we think about what cannot be seen because it is in the shadow. And that feels really important for the conversation that we're having today. The shadow is often scary to us because it's dark and we can't see. <laughs> but the light helps us look at the shadow and the shadow always has nourishment it is the womb, it is fecund, and it can be our friend. So that's what this light represents for us tonight. Thank you. Well, that's uh, a better way than talking shop, but let's do a <laughs> bit of shop. So what do you do? <laughs> Yeah. So I serve as the Climate Action Coordinator for the United Religions Initiative. And as you have said, um, URI is probably the largest um, interfaith grassroots organization. Um, it's comprised of cooperation circles. These are groups that can be eight people or 200 people. These groups are coming together across religious beliefs or indigenous knowledge and bringing grassroots ingenuity to solve issues in their area, um, their area meaning where they live in their locality. Um, and as climate action coordinator, I am often working with them on 
finding each other. So they may be doing very good earth restoration acts where they are, but they need some mentoring or they need to know who else is doing something similar so that that action can grow and spread. And so um, this work is about that. And you, how long have you been in this role? Since 2020. Okay. And were you, um, were you exposed to some of the worst, bad to worst case scenarios and analyses of the environmental situation before then? Or is this something more recent? Yes, I've been doing work that I call eco-chaplaincy since about 2007. And probably like many of us, um, I was doing a lot of um, informing, cheerleading, trying to um, invite action. And it, it was as though the louder I sounded the alarm, the less imaginative the response. <laughs> and so um, to be in this space now, where we are talking about adaptation or collapse or societal breakdown, for me, it was like a relief to really um, identify an elephant in the room instead of continuing to fight for um, something that just was falling on deaf ears. Mm. So how long have you been talking about the environmental situation in particular as something that is or will disrupt increasingly the lives of the people in the faith organizations or the cooperation circles. Wait, has that, have you done that for years? Or, cause you said you've obviously done eco-chaplaincy for years and got some frustration there in that time. How long have you been talking about, oh no, this is actually going to destabilize and disrupt um, uh, the lives of, of, well, all of us to some degree. Yeah, I think that I started to um, become more courageous about talking in that way um, around 2019. Mm -hmm. um, it still can feel very provocative, especially when I'm speaking with people who um, live in a really different socioeconomic system than I. Um, I know that in the Western world, I have lived in a place that is causing a great deal of the problem. And of course, some of the cooperation circles that I work with are living in a very different set of circumstances. Um, and so it, it invites some nuance into how we talk about it, but um, more and more, I think people are keen to talk about this. Yeah, that's really intriguing because it would be a very different conversation, I suppose, in places where we've got um, where we where, where where it's currently mainly about um, grief and anxiety about the future or about others, um, rather than. Um, actual coping right now with the direct disruptions. That's right. Um, is there opportunity for dialogue across those differences within, within the URI or other contexts? There is. Um, I think there's, this is where I would say the, the reconciliation R of, of the deep adaptation framework is incredibly useful to be able to have um, caring conversations about discrepancies and injury or harm and what might we be doing to mend where we can, to provide care where we can. Um, it's really messy mm -hmm. and necessary. Mm -hmm. And um... <clears throat> These cooperation circles, they are explicitly 
faith-based. Is that right? Well, um, they are, and there is a very large group of indigenous voices at the United Religions Initiative as well. So okay. um, they they might not identify their belief system as religious, right? But mm -hmm. they're bringing a spirituality or a cosmovision, as they often call it, into the conversation. I see. And uh, that's... Um... Do you find that more people are opening up to that and what and 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 seeing the uh, validity and power in those cosmo visions like outside of those communities too i absolutely do when we have indigenous voices or um, actual indigenous teachers in our conversations with cooperation circles uh, attendance is high. Mm -hmm. People are hungry for um, feeling connected to these earth-centered conversations and spaces. And do you think that hunger is because of a lack? Absolutely. How would you describe that lack? I think that many of us are starving for connection to the living system. And when I say that, I mean a, a, a life cycle, a, a cycle that holds us in birth, death, and rebirth. It's regenerative. It's absolutely present in birth all around us. Um, but we have fallen... We, we believe that we have fallen out of relationship with it. I don't know that that is always true. Mm -hmm. um, some of us have chosen to not be in relationship with it. Some of us have um, led ourselves to believe that we can't be in connection with it, but um, that belonging, I believe, is always there for us. Yes, it's, it's uh, we externalize when actually the the separation is and the denial is part of who we are inside ourselves mm -hmm. as an expression of nature yeah so it's self-harming as much as harming yeah. others or, or nature yeah um mm. so i'm interested in um if things are going to get really tough for more people. They're really tough already, and they have been for centuries for, for, for many people um, because of the systems, economic, industrial, and so on, that have added to or caused the, the predicament we're in. But I'm interested in whether religions, or we can use the term faith-based organizations, or belief systems that are related to all that, the extent to which they're going to potentially help reduce harm uh, and encourage mm -hmm. ongoing commitment to stuff that we think is good, no matter what how, how bad things are becoming, and also perhaps find some meaning and even joy within this situation, or the opposite. Um, because I've been, the last few years I've studied psychology uh, because it was really interesting to see how people were reacting very differently to some of the bad to worst case scenarios around climate. Uh, and I've discovered that what psychologists call worldview defense, so that when you're anxious, uh, you can double down on your identity and your worldview. That gives you a sense of place, a sense of solidity, in a changing world, in a scary world. And that is often equated with then um, effectively, you know, a hardening, a numbing, a bit more bigotry and that sort of stuff. It's, it's seen mm -hmm. in that way mm -hmm. rather than an opening of the heart and mind uh, and therefore not correlated with more compassion, more solidarity. So I'm interested in, I think, probably faith-based organizations and faith-based leaders, uh, faith leaders have a role to play. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's just um, 
wishful thinking. What's your sense of whether faith-based organizations are have, gonna have a significant, or already have a significant role as, we've, as we move into a more disrupted era and more instances of societal collapse? Yeah. Um, really, really right on to name that there can be um, like this digging in of one's heels in, in terms of uh, defending the identity, right? And um, we can all share stories of um, a more fundamentalist expression of a religious tradition that does that. Um, and I think it's easy for us to feel um, fearful and concern about that being the case as um, the climate crisis worsens. The space where I feel much more curious and um, optimistic would be in this interfaith um, landscape because the religions are very interested in learning together. They're very interested in kind of coming around the campfire as it were and saying, how do you work with this? Or this is what our teaching is on this topic. How about you? And that level of um, interest and cooperation, of course, makes things possible um, in how we respond when crisis hits. Yeah, I am also very drawn to the openness and curiosity and almost the uh, the sense of knowing that uh, the divine, the spiritual, is mysterious and therefore all of our ways of describing it, writing it down and preaching about it will be limited. Um, and all of our practices for bringing us to a certain state of consciousness will work for some people, not others. Will you know, and so let's talk about it, let's experiment. I, I'm very drawn to that, which I see that in in those, even if they're very, very grounded in their own particular faith, are very comfortable about exploring and comparing and integrating with others. Um, yes. Rather than needing to condemn in order to somehow defend and secure their own place in the world. Um, so yes, I, I'm, I'm very drawn to, to that indeed. Um, I just want to tell you though about um like there's, there's a more and more conversations I'm having with um with people in the Christian faith, but different kinds of uh, different denominations when we talk about the state of the world, and I'm hearing very very different um, responses. Um, one person would tell me. Oh, I'm completely fine with what you're talking about, Jem. My faith as a Christian, we anticipate the end of the world and the end times, and that's totally fine. Uh, that just makes me feel more confident about my faith and my choices um, in life. Uh, for example, another person um, had to stop working with me because he thought his faith was that, that he should actually maintain a sense of hope understood in terms of a material hope for humanity on Earth. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that was his particular interpretation of things. And mm -hmm. therefore, and, uh, having a faith-based response to anticipated um, um, disruption and, and, and regress materially for humanity on Earth just didn't fit. And then I now start hearing of other people saying that, you know, we're going to we can, on the one hand, we're going to have a rapture, and on the other hand, we're going to have a new earth created, and, and it all gets very confusing, and I, at the moment, I haven't created time in my life to study well, <laughs> where all this stuff is coming from. So as you're the expert, can you just solve it? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, all these right. different stories I'm hearing. Well, um, I mean, this idea of hope, let's, let's start with that one, because um, certainly, religions are supposed to, in their very nature, provide us a sense of salvation. They're, they're helping us solve 
a lived experience problem. And there is hope in having that solution. And so, um, ooh, I think about many of my friends and colleagues um, practicing in a Christian tradition who absolutely want to see light at the end of this tunnel. Um, and I think it takes a mature faith and spiritual practice to consider that um, there are different ways of defining hope. <laughs> and um, that, I mean, oftentimes, you know, Joanna Macy is talking about active hope. You have had conversations um, where we explore radical hope, this idea of when um, all hope is lost, what is still there? And that is a very important theological question. Um, I, I think it's where we really, it gets gritty in there. And um, a weekly visit to Sunday school or to Torah school or to the mosque isn't going to be enough for us to really hang out in that space, which is why I am um, feeling so adamant that faith leaders um, need to be working with this, working with a, um, an invitation to consider what adaptation actually means and what it implies. Um, you also really spoke to what I mentioned earlier as the more fundamentalist expression that the rapture comes. And I, I can't speak um, too concretely about that, but what I, what I would offer as a counter is that religion literally means to bind oneself again, to connect again, ligare, to bind, redo it again. So as a, as a person who is um, practicing in a religious tradition, what do I want to be binding myself to again and again and again? Do I want to wed myself to empire and this idea that um, there is something greater somewhere else? Maybe. But do I also want to consider binding myself to creation, to earth, the idea that, that heaven is here in sangha and community and congregation, and that we could be tending this life story right here? That's, that's an invitation for us. Yes. And what I'm hearing from you there is, is how heart, how, how heart led or heart centered is any of our uh, discussion and use and retelling of stories about uh, uh, faith or stories about the current moment. So it's, it's like, um, um, I'm suspicious of any of any of any story which is just helping people push things away, not worry, and just continue as they as they are. So I I'm am really also suspicious in the of this. That, that, that how faith leaders can help their congregations and others think through. Well, okay, things really might be getting difficult for humanity. How do I? Um, embrace these times and other people uh, and nature you, you've mentioned that more fully uh, in response um, rather than just sort of have an exit from or worrying about this because of, of a particular story I think so I'm I'm interested in that I just want to say to uh, those uh, you who are with us on this on this call that um, if you do have a question for, for Lauren Van Ham, please send uh, it to Katie um, and then I will be able to uh, come to you in a few minutes. Um, so please do have a think and don't be shy. Please do, do send those, those now. Um, so yeah, I, I'm interested in, um, you, you, it was great for you to talk about re-legion the, the reunion, the um, and 
and that it's an invitation there to think about how are we uh, reconnecting um, and that also remembering our innate existing connection. Um, I know we've talked in the past or just corresponded in the past about the notion of apocalypse, which again, if we're talking about how religions are talking about the environmental predicament, um, is, a, is a concept that's there. And I think perhaps there's, um, it's almost like there's a, a tendency to go fully catastrophic and fully apocalyptic in the, in the, the sense of it meaning that, oh, well, if we don't have modern industrial consumer society, we don't have capitalism, uh, we don't have this old story of continual material progress, then we just have the end of the world. Um, we just have human extinction, we have all that. And there, there seems to be this, poof, we're just going to go to there. Um, some people say that might be to do with the ap apocalyptic imaginary in many of our cultures. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? How can you sort of help people unpack the apocalypse uh, to actually not just sort of shut down and actually to open up and be present to whatever's coming? Yeah, um, I really underline what you've said, Jem, about this Hollywood notion of what apocalypse looks like. And uh, again, if we just look at the etymology, um, Apocalypse isn't the end of the world, it's pulling back the veil to see what's coming next. And this is maybe what I meant in our opening today when I was inviting us to think about holding the light to what is in the shadow. Um, in, in a time of societal breakdown, in a time of climate collapse, can we lean in? Can we lift the veil? Um, can we shine a light in the dark to see what is coming next? Because an empire certainly isn't supposed to last. <laughs> Empires fall. We know this. Um, when the empire falls, what's coming? I feel incredibly curious about that, and I think you do too. Yeah, thank you. And it's interesting to hear you use the terminology of, of, of empire and you're referring not to a particular nation, I guess. You're, you're talking to an, 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 an imperial system, I presume, to do with money, property, patriarchy and, and the consumer culture built on top of all of that. Is that what you mean? Growth, mm. growth, growth. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, before we go to questions, I just want to, what, what animates you and excites you in the world of faith-based organizations and how they're responding to either real-time current massive disruptions because of environmental change or this more nebulous sort of eco-distress anxiety or, or where people wake up to what's, what's coming at us? What's, what's the good practice and the that you want people to know about and hmm. you can talk about your own work if you want <laughs> What's both end is this <laughs> <laughs> both end i mean i i um think all of us feel excited if we if we think about the r's and the deep adaptation framework restoration is low-hanging fruit it feels so good to see healing and restoration happening and there are fantastic stories of this in um cooperation circles around the world. Probably one of the most heartening ones is an agroforestry effort that's happening in Malawi, where last year um, there were trees being planted on Malawi farms. Um, I think to the total, like around 20,000 and this coming year, 45,000 trees will be on um, planted in a, in a mass agroforestry initiative on people's property in these farms. Um, so great. Um, the work that I am doing that um, is also within cooperation circles at URI, a, a couple are participating, is teaching a course that is very much about deep adaptation, teaching the R framework. And I often um, am speaking with interfaith groups about how adaptation can be 
something that is instructive for clergy people to, to use with their congregations, always, always grounding it in a fifth R, R for reverence, um, very much the way that we opened today. Um, I really love doing that work too. With the, uh, the four R's, so this, this, for those of you who don't know, the, the, uh, the deep adaptation paper that I wrote four years ago, I thought we didn't really have a way of talking about these things. And we just therefore went to this catastrophic imaginary and just thought, well, I can't think of that. We've got to believe we can fix these things. Otherwise, I just won't get out of bed in the morning. It's like we just didn't have a way of talking about it. So then I came up with three R's, which were uh, three questions. Um, and then, you know, summarize them with, you know, restoration, uh, resilience and um, relinquishment. And then I added a one on reconciliation uh, to invite this idea that we are not in control and we do need to make peace with mortality and the things that are going to be lost. But um, tell me about, like, is there a question around reverence? Have you created mm. a question yet? For this fifth R? Um, you know, I was really inspired by a conversation that Katie had with Stephen Wright a number of months ago, um, where he was inviting his listeners to, um, in kind of a meditative space, ask the question, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? And that is a question that I would put to reverence on the daily. <laughs> when, I wake up, when I wake up in the morning, what do you, 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 <laughs> what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? Yeah, thanks for that. And I'm just enjoying in my ear I'm, I'm how Stephen says it. <laughs> I've suddenly just had that. Uh, a harmony of your voice and his <laughs> from my imagination. <laughs> so we're going to uh, Josie McLean in, in Australia for a first question for, 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 for Lauren. If, if you're there, can you turn on your camera as well so we don't have an ugly image? Uh, there we go. Sorry. We've got you. Hi. You might regret that. I have to get out of my jammies really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Lauren and Jim. Um, so I'm wondering about kind of the difference between faith-based and non-faith-based communities in a way. So um, I've been working with a small community just off and on um, over the last couple of years that was kind of wiped out by the fires that we had here in the Adelaide Hills a couple of years ago. So they saw their homes, um, in some cases, their neighbours die as a result of the fires. Um, and there's a lot of deep trauma in this community, as you could imagine. And we're a couple of years on now and that trauma is still there. Um, and I kind of thought that it might've disappeared or been starting to be healed by now, but I'm now expecting it to last years. And I'm wondering, um, I'm just kind of curious about what you're seeing. I'm curious about um, whether there's a difference between faith-based communities and not. What I'm seeing is that it's really going to the heart of the question of identity for these people as they've watched their lives change, particularly after, you know, some months after the fires, um, the, the patterns of their lives changed. And so, um, you know, there's trauma just in that, losing the pattern of your life, that all of that. So I'll leave it there. That's kind of the context. I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. Thank you, Josie. You know, there's, there's an incredible amount of work that is happening now around um, trauma-informed responses and um, what does community resilience look like in the face of um, horrible, catastrophic violence, you name it. Um, I think it's really important. And I, um, I would hope that faith-based organizations can become centers of resilience in their communities so that even if I am not a person of faith or I don't belong to this particular temple, that I could walk in 
and receive trauma-informed support, we're definitely not there yet. But I would hope that that would be true. And I would also hope that um, this sort of um, adaptation and trauma-informed response would start to be the operation um, that is prevalent in schools and neighborhood associations and senior centers. Uh, you know, may it be so. We're not there yet, but may it be so. So important. So that, that response, Lauren, um, uh, actually, I think has triggered something here for me, which is that what is the ideal for organized religion with the massive landowners? They have massive resources. They, they, they can connect with communities and already do in many cases. So what, in an ideal world, what, what would they be doing? You've given one example there around trauma and, and their ability to help people in difficult situations. And ha have you, or perhaps there's even, there's a list of all the things that, that could be done using the assets and skills and, uh, and trust that these organizations have, organized religion. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some like living, breathing examples of that already. Um, there are a few churches and well, uh, the one example that is coming to mind right now is a church and a mosque who have cooperated in Minneapolis um, to become a resilient center for people living there. They've created a micro grid um, with solar energy, but then they also open their doors to people who need a hot meal or a place to sleep. Um, there are also churches and houses of worship that are becoming cooling centers for places where there are extreme um, hot temperatures. Um, and, and so we would hope that um, faith-based entities would all be um, tooling up and really becoming, you know, kind of these epicenters and, and well-resourced to respond. Now, of course, that won't matter if the flood comes there, right? But in the ways that the, the houses of worship can respond, we would want them to do that. Yeah, we've got uh, four questions and uh, just over a quarter of an hour. So, I'm going to ask everyone to ask their questions very succinctly. So it can be actually quite powerful to not give the context, to just go bam with the question. So we go to Katie now for a question, and then we'll see if we can squeeze them all in. So, Thanks. so my question is about patriarchal monotheism. I'm thinking specifically about the Abrahamic religions where God is separate from human. God is sacred, human is not. And that separation is so profound and so profoundly damaging. Um, and it's there even in our, you know, our my, mental models about good, bad, right, wrong. Um, and so I'm wondering about where is the potential for reparation, for accountability, for reconciliation, when something is, it has the status of orthodoxy, um, both in terms of the big picture narrative, but also people's lived lives as they're animated by these beliefs? Thank you. I'm sure I can answer that in 14 minutes. Um, such a great question, Katie, and just, a friend of mine has a t-shirt that says Jesus colon. And then what Jesus says is, I didn't say that. There is so much that is misunderstood about um, what sacred scriptures say because organized religion and empire um, used it. And so I really feel strongly that Clergy people who are worth their salt need to help us unlearn this really unhelpful narrative. We need to be hearing this every Saturday, Sunday, Friday from the pulpit 
to unlearn this story. That's one of the best and most powerful ways to um, bring repair. Yeah, thank you. And it, it, um, I think it maybe feeds into Terry, your, your, your question as well. So um, if you can unmute and, and ask your question. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you, uh, sorry, your name is Lauren, <laughs> for this session. It's, it's inspiring. Uh, I'll get straight to the question. Uh, it seems to me that, and to many others, that a very large and powerful segment of mainstream Protestant, evangelical, fundamentalist religious communities, here in the U.S. especially, have conflated spiritual faith with civil religion spirituality with patriotism, as it were, which spawns an ultra-conservative Christian political right, a nationalism that many see, frankly, as a lot more than just fanaticism, but naturally a kind of proto-fascism. And I'm just curious whether you personally or you or I more generally see anything like this emerging beyond just what we're seeing. And I live in Florida in the United States where the state is as red and like this as it can possibly be. Um, so I'm curious if you see this yourself or uh, more broadly in the URI landscape. Thanks, Terry, for um, representing. I don't know, your shirt's blue. You're representing a different voice in Florida. So thank you for that. Um, I. I think the shortest answer in this moment, and I would be happy to talk with you more about this, but um, what we feed grows. And the United States and other countries too, who are experiencing ingredients that you've named, um, we, it is on us to feed what we want to grow. And um, that is a spiritual practice worth 24 hours of my day. Hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm just remembering my own uh, constant questioning of where should I put my own time? Should I work with the people who I think already get it and are aligned and support them and help them do what I think is useful and benefit from that relationship? Or do I go to the barricades and have an argument and push back and um the last two months i'm doing the latter <laughs> and it's a very it's a different thing and i can only do it in thinking that it's momentary um yeah i only do it thinking it's momentary but also i i do feel I, uh, that some calling out some challenging some critiquing has to be done it's like otherwise i feel like we're um yeah we can just be swept away by the bigger forces in the world and uh and even if we're going to be swept away by the bigger forces in the world i want to know at least i did something mm -hmm. said something gave more people bridges into a different way of seeing things and joining people in a different way of being and living um, we are going to, I think, Colleen Elgin next. Your question, please. Hi. Um, thanks for um, being on doing this, Jim, and also thanks, Lauren. Um, my question has to do with, um, you know, there are people, as we all know, that believe humans are going to go extinct. And in this moment, at this point in the journey, I am curious how you work with that. Um, you know, Houston Smith said we're born in mystery, we live in mystery, and we die in mystery. And so for me, mystery is a big part of it. And it's not that we couldn't go extinct. Of course we could, you know. But it's just, I'm just curious at, from the spiritual perspective, how you work with that part of what's happening on the planet. I think it depends on the day. I have times when I feel incredibly sad at that thought, um, especially 
to consider how much we have brought that upon ourselves, that our choices would lead to human extinction at an accelerated rate um, really brings me to my knees. When I think about it um, from a space of deep time, um, a la Thomas Berry and Brian Swim, I can be quite peaceful about it in um, thinking, wow, how interesting that we would be here for a time and then we are no longer needed in the giant story and let's tend to that. Hmm. I'm interested, Colleen, how do, hmm. you, how do you engage people who respond to you by saying, oh, well, humans are going extinct soon and it was our destiny, any organism that has an influx of uh, unsustainable resource, whether it's algae with leaves flowing into the pond or it's humans suddenly discovering coal and oil. Um, it's just nature taking its course, so chill out. <laughs> How do you respond? Well, when you, hear that? you know, um, that could happen. You know, that certainly could happen. I guess I'm not, um, I, I kind of feel like, I'm more of the mind like what is helpful right now and and some of those voices are helpful actually because it's it's bringing in a certain dimension that's needed we're not paying attention and as we all are aware on this call you know we're going into this collapse pretty unaware as a human species mm -hmm. so the voices that are saying actually it's even worse than that you know we're going to go extinct are really important in that larger field um but I'm a little bit more of the mind, I guess, that is that also kind of a little bit of human hubris? Like, we know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's the part that rubs me, actually, is just that because that is also what has got us into this a little bit um, as humans. You know, I include myself in that. And so I just wonder how is there a way to work with that to help us grow into appreciating that mystery and gratitude even more. Um, and in a sense, Lauren answered it to some degree. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Um, yeah. And also for this invitation to not know and therefore not be judgmental, even with the people who are quite categorical about their view. It's like, well, um, yeah, let's not just start being um, combative about this. There's we, we we don't know how bad it's going how bad it's going to get and it could even mean human extinction i mean in the deep adaptation paper i i talked about all these different ways of framing things and that it is as much seems to be about who we are as what actually information we can marshal to come up with a conclusion and so i said that right now where i'm at is i see societal collapse as inevitable uh, a catastrophic catastrophic impact on uh, humanity globally as like uh, likely as in that means you know billions of people uh, dying younger than than would otherwise if it wasn't for this environmental predicament and um, human extinction um, this century as now possible but that was it, it was like possible um, and I have not managed to find really good evidence at the moment that 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 is going to definitely happen like if i dig down in the arguments about say nuclear power station meltdown they're not they're not good they're not backed up uh, properly um that's where i'm at at the moment and i do however value the the people who've helped me look at the ultimate catastrophe for humanity it's quite a powerful it's almost like a meditative practice, you know, like, like your people who invite you to meditate on your own death. It's like, well, meditate on the, uh, the, the death of your species, actually take it to heart and see how it helps you re reconsider everything um, that you may have thought about your own life. So many of us are living with stories of legacy, whether that's ki kids, nephews, or whether it's just adding to culture or, and take that away. Because ultimately, what's really interesting is is take everything away and then see what remains. In terms, take everyone in terms of our stories of meaning. So, um, uh, I'm going to read out a question from I think Greg, who because his internet is going down. Yeah, Greg Smith. 
Uh, he writes, uh, I feel we have pathologized the climate crisis, seeing it as a kind of disease that needs to be cured and or defeated. It says also like the war language as well, not just the, the curing. Um, um, so I, I think of it as ecological healing, says Greg, one that invites us to participate in new healthy ways so we can align with the new healthy reorganization despite the truth we share now that it's all going to be quite unpleasant mm. so the healing journey can be unpleasant of course so what are your thoughts on on this lauren mm. hey greg um there are some friendly adapters on this call i know from um other spaces and it's really great people who've been in the training and whatnot um i I like what you are inviting us to consider there. I think that um, very often when something has um, been wounded, we learn something in the healing process, don't we? <laughs> and um, it feels somewhat connected to what Jem and Colleen were just talking about too, that it's not right of us to make declarative statements about what something is because we can't be 100 sure and it's why reverence is so important to me as i do this work um to to stay in some space of mystery feels very important it right sizes me and um that earth could be giving us a huge teaching in this moment yes um it doesn't minimize my anxiety or my grief around what is being lost and what is going extinct at because of choices we have made. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rene, you have a question for Lauren. Oh, hold on. Yes. No, oh. I, I yeah, can. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, I can. I was thinking it might be something that I chatted with you some other time, Lauren, but I've got a, a faith community um, where I live and my daughter works in a cafe in this, um, at the United Church and it's part of a social enterprise. And she really loves working there. Uh, it's a great space. And um, I've sort of thought about, you know, inroads into this community because they're all about um, social justice and I've overheard them sort of having conversations about a lot yeah lots of um, yeah well there's there's opportunity it feels like there's opportunity there <clears throat> and I'm just thinking about how to engage with this young guy the manager at the cafe and how to come into a space like that as a non religious person, but in a space that feels really community minded and really positive. And I looked at some of the links that you shared about, you know, what the interfaith groups are doing. And yeah, so it's probably a discussion for another time, but just thinking about um, a place that my, my, my daughter loves being, and that could potentially be some kind of hub, like the examples that you've yeah. given. I think, yeah. Renee, it's a really important question, which is that those of us who do feel moved to try and help people understand how bad things are and what's coming and, and invite them into that space in a generative, positive way, yeah. uh, how to do that um, rather than just um, alienating them. And also the, the difficulty, which is then it, it, it's tough on us if we get really strong negative reactions. So for me, it's been a a question I, I, I know something I shy away from doing a lot of the time now. Um, so I suppose you need to be clear about why you're doing it. Lauren, your thoughts on, on this? Well, Renee, I think one thing that I, I think I heard you say is that it's a younger audience. And um, so that I, I immediately um, approach that conversation almost from a different space um, because this is their world to inherit and um 
we all want to be really thoughtful about how we're showing up for them in this time and uh, how we are perhaps providing them some ways to hold the enormity, the big feelings, uh, the task at hand. So um, again, I think that the deep adaptation framework is a phenomenal way to do it. And I would love to talk with you more about that. Um, sure. The work that reconnects, you know, there, there are some, some really good tools um, for helping people, I think, look at something with honesty, but not feel um, then like they need to go hide under a rock, that, that they can stay engaged and keep their eyes wide open. Yes. So and, I do hope you, you do get the chance yeah. to uh, connect afterwards. Do, do get yeah. in touch, Rene, if you need help. Thank with you, Lauren. Thanks, everybody Steve. then do look and, um, well, as you've all registered for this meeting, we'll, um, you'll get a follow-up email with some links. Lauren, before we go, you mentioned a training. Um, could you just say a few words on that? Because that may also be of interest to not only us here, but also people who watch this afterwards on video. Sure. Um, as it stands now, there are sort of two ways that um, a, a group of us called Project Adapt have uh, created tools for anyone who's interested. There's a four session series where we teach the R's, the questions that the R's ask of us and ways that we might engage. And this is mostly um, from a a space of reverence. It's it's something that sort of invites us to be spiritually um, active and engaged. There's also um, something called the eight practices of adaptation. And these are for anyone to engage wherever they are, maybe a bit like the 12 steps for um, some who are familiar with that path. But the eight practices of adaptation are something that I can use throughout the day when I am encountering moments that invite me to relinquish or become more resilient, as an example. Thank you. So if you're watching this on YouTube, look down there, there'll be some links and all of you just check your inbox in a few days. So uh, thank you, Katie, for your support today. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us. And um, thank you, everyone else, for joining from around the world. And uh, yeah, thank you for lighting that candle. Okay, so uh, the next one is Katie. When is the next one? It's with you and Matthew Painter, isn't it? Yes, it's on the 22nd of uh, September. It's a different time zone. If you're in the States, it's likely to be a very early morning, but we'll be talking about coaching in the context of deep adaptation and collapse. Okay, and um, uh, if you're interested in that, and it's before the 22nd, links down there on YouTube, and also just check your inbox for the rest of you. You'll get a link to that too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, bye. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Gemini.